Hey guys, welcome back. You loved the Call of the Midwife reaction and it made me so happy because it was so fun making it and seeing that you guys could learn something from me watching TV was so cool. Highly requested, both on Instagram and on YouTube, was a reaction to season three, episode five of Downton Abbey. Now, I have never seen this show. I do not know what it's about. I have no idea what's in this episode. It better be something OBGYN or women's health related. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. I would love if you subscribed. We have a lot of fun here. And we will be right back with season three, episode five of Downton Abbey. <laughs> These early labor pains show that the womb is preparing itself for birth. It seems like there's a whole bunch of people living in a really big house and one of them is pregnant and in labor. It looks like maybe the 1800s. I'm not sure. Again, I've never seen an episode of this. So we'll just keep watching and see. He did misdiagnose Matthew and he did miss the warning signs with Lavinia. I'll ask him to include Clarkson in his deliberations. Will that satisfy you? So it sounds like they are not really very trusting of the doctor that's taking care of their family member who's in labor. Um, and they're trying to get a second opinion or a second doctor involved, something like that. They haven't really called them a doctor. I don't know exactly who these people are, um, but whoever was assessing her, they don't have 100% confidence in. Um, and this is really important when you have a healthcare provider that, that you're confident in and that you trust them. And I always tell people, it's like dating. You don't have to marry everybody that you date. And so if a patient comes to me and they don't really like me or we just don't mesh and that's not gonna be the best relationship, it's okay to switch. It doesn't hurt my feelings and it shouldn't hurt anybody else's feelings. If you don't have 100% confidence in the person taking care of you, then you should find somebody else. It's just really important for both you and your baby that we all work together and have a certain level of trust and a certain relationship that we can count on. My ankles are swelling and my head aches. Honestly, I cannot recommend this to anyone. I'm a little worried we're gonna have the same thing as last time, so if you watched the Call the Midwife reaction, we had an episode that had preeclampsia. She's now complaining of swelling and a headache, which can be, in some cases, associated with preeclampsia. Anxiety is an enemy to pregnancy. Don't, whatever you do, feel anxious. Okay, two things. One, He's right in that it sometimes takes much longer than a few months to get pregnant after you start trying to start a family. Normal time to conception can be even up to a year. So unless there's something else going on to make us worried, we don't generally work people up for fertility problems until they've been trying to get pregnant for about a year. Now that can vary if something's going on like irregular cycles, history of some kind of injury, problems that are obvious. You don't have to try for a year, but if everything seems to be lying now, okay, then trying for a year may be normal. The other side of that, don't ever tell anybody who is trying to get pregnant and anxious about it to just not be anxious. I mean, when was that ever something that worked? When could you ever tell somebody, oh, I'm sorry that you're anxious about this, just don't be anxious. Okay, clearly, we would all not be anxious about things if we could just go, oh, great idea, I never thought of that. I'm not anxious now, we're just gonna try again not being anxious. It just doesn't make sense, right? You can't just become unanxious about something. So I don't really love how we handled that. That's not how I would handle that as a physician if somebody told me they were anxious about getting pregnant. It's very normal to feel like that when you're ready to start trying to start a family if it doesn't happen in the time frame that you had hoped. That doesn't mean it's abnormal in that time frame, but it is okay if you're anxious about it or if you're worried about it. So come in and talk to me. I promise not to tell you to stop being anxious. I've been talking to Lord Grantham about the good doctor. Sir Philip feels the room would be too crowded. It might be better to leave old Clarkson out of it for the time being. I don't really understand why he's so weird about having an extra person around. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them there. There's nothing more tiring than waiting for something to happen. I feel like that's like the whole last part of pregnancy. Like people just come in to their visits and they're so ready to have a baby and have, you know, that happy day. And it's the longest three or four weeks of your life waiting to go into labor waiting for something to happen and not knowing when it's going to happen. You know, the old saying like, it's like watching water waiting to boil. I totally butchered that. That is not the saying at all, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's so true though. Like waiting to go into labor is just the most exhausting process for families and especially for moms who just have to try to go on with their normal life until it happens. Sybil's ankles are swollen and she seems muddled. Well, sort of muddled. Not quite there, not quite in the present moment. And what do you think it means? It means she's having a baby. <laughs> a word, Dr. Clarkson. 
Okay, the new doctor came in, the family doctor, I guess, who has known all of them for a long time, and he brings up some super valid concerns that she's not really acting like herself because he knows her and that her ankles are swollen and he's just a little bit worried and the other doctor has just completely dismissed those. This is not how I see most interactions between two physicians happen. I really value if somebody brings up, you know, hey, I'm kind of worried about this um, patient that you've been taking care of. Do you want to look more into it? And I feel like a collaborative healthcare environment is super important. And I think most of us do, but this person apparently just completely dismissed those concerns. And as an OBGYN, they sound pretty legitimate. I think she may be toxemic with a danger of eclampsia, in which case we must act fast. Okay, do you guys remember? Toxemia is the old word for preeclampsia. This new doctor has very legitimate concerns. She has a headache, she's not acting right, her feet are swollen. So he's telling him, I'm worried that she has preeclampsia. I'm worried that this could progress to something worse really quickly like eclampsia, which is seizures, and we have to act quickly to figure out if that's what's happening and help her. And the other doctor is completely dismissing him. It is a little bit scary because his concerns seem very legitimate to me as an OBGYN. There is no danger whatsoever. Judging by my experience, Lady Sybil is behaving perfectly normally. Do you not find the baby small? Not unusually so. Oh my gosh. Okay. So he said, do you not find the baby to be small? The reason he's asking about this in relation to discussing preeclampsia is because blood pressure issues and preeclampsia, which have been going on for a long period of time, can cause growth restriction. We call this IUGR, intrauterine growth restriction, and it can be caused by a whole bunch of different things, but we know it correlates with high blood pressure and long-standing preeclampsia in some cases. So he's right to be worried if these things are going on and he thinks that the baby might be small because it could be indicative of a long-standing hypertensive problem. And the ankles? Maybe she has thick ankles. Lots of women do. But she does not. The other doctor passes this off as, she just might have fat ankles. What the heck? Who says that? I mean, I understand this is a different time period, but rude and that's ridiculous. I want to test the latest sample of her urine. Oh, for heaven's sake. Just give the order to the nurse, please, Sir Philip. Okay, he wants to test the latest sample of her urine. What's he looking for, guys? We learned this last time. He's looking for protein in her urine. All of her symptoms, if they are associated with protein in the urine, could be indicative of preeclampsia. She definitely looks like she's in labor, she's hurting, but she also could be developing something called HELP syndrome. This is a condition which is sometimes associated with preeclampsia, and it stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. We see this clinically as a woman who comes in with preeclampsia or high blood pressure, and she has a lot of pain on the right side. It's hard to tell from that clip if she's hurting because she's in labor or if she's hurting because she has pain on that right side. But if she's getting HELP syndrome and her liver is swelling, her liver enzymes may be becoming abnormal, her platelets might be dropping, making her more likely to bleed after delivery. And if her liver is swelling and that propagates liver failure, in some cases it can, or bleeding into the liver, this can be a serious and life-threatening complication even now. And I'm sure in this time period would have been even worse. And that other doctor is a jerk. I would never let him take care of me or my family members. It's my belief that Lady Sybil is at risk of eclampsia. Her baby is small. She's confused and there's far too much albumin, uh, that is protein in her urine. All right, there's a lot to dissect here. His assessment of what might be going on seems really accurate even by what we look at nowadays. The fact remains, if I am right, we must act at once. And do what? Get her down to the hospital and deliver the child by cesarean section. They talk about she needs a C-section. This isn't really necessary in preeclampsia nowadays. We don't think that that would change her risk unless it's going to be a very prolonged period of time until she delivers and her blood pressure can't be controlled. So the difference between then and now is that we know how to decrease the chances of preeclampsia becoming eclampsia with the seizures. And that's by giving IV magnesium sulfate to the mom during the labor process. So we would not just rush you back for a C-section now if you had preeclampsia. If it was going to be, you know, days before we could get the baby to come out vaginally, then it might be another story, but we usually can try to have a baby the normal way if you have preeclampsia. That being said, 
if your blood pressure is just completely unable to be controlled, if you are getting worse and worse really quickly, these might be indications for expedient delivery by C-section because the only way we know to really stop the process of preeclampsia is to deliver the baby. But is that safe? It is the opposite of safe. It would expose mother and child to untold danger. She could pick up any kind of infection in a public hospital. The other doctor is concerned about taking her to the hospital because she might catch infections. That's true even now, although much lower risk because we have a lot better understanding of how bacteria and viruses are transmitted. We have clean water, we use gloves, we have sterile operating technique, and we wash our hands all the time. And so he is right to be concerned because in this time period, going to a hospital could result in things like that a lot more easily than it can now. But we have that still today. It's called nosocomial infections, and that's where somebody goes into the hospital for something unrelated and acquires an infection associated with their hospital stay. It's not super common in labor and delivery units, but it does happen. It can happen anywhere in the hospital. So we do the best we can to wash our hands all the time, use lots of hand sanitizer, always, always, always use sterile technique, always use gloves and clean everything, sterilize it, send it downstairs to the sterilizer between patients if it's something that we reuse. But honestly, a lot of the things that we use nowadays, we don't reuse because of this risk. Also, can I just say I really love his like giant eye roll there. A cesarean? is a gamble which might kill either or both of them. So super interesting, right? They're very concerned about doing a C-section because the risk of dying from a C-section in those days was a lot higher than it is now. Now, it's extremely rare to have major complications from a C-section. It is not impossible, it does happen, but it is very, very uncommon. Back then, having a C-section was a newer procedure. Surgeries were not as safe, antibiotics were either not invented or not as good. I don't know for sure what year this is. And surgical technique was just not nearly what it is these days. So he's right. I mean, it is a very, I don't, difficult risk benefit analysis. And I'll just say, I'm really happy I was not practicing obstetrics back then because this would be really, really hard to decide. Has the operation now, do you swear you can save her? I cannot swear it, no. But if we do not operate, and if I am right about her condition, then she will die. But Dr. Clarkson is not sure he can save her. Sir Philip is certain he can bring her through it with a living child. Isn't a certainty stronger than a doubt? So interestingly, it looks like the doctor who knows her really well thinks that the other doctor is just being hard-headed and doesn't want to be proven wrong now. They ask, are you sure that you can save her? And the doctor who I'm now growing to really like says, like, that's never a guarantee. This is risky either way. And he's right. In those time periods, it really was. But the other doctor says, no, I can totally do this. She's going to be fine. She's staying here. It should never really be like a that confident thing. Even now, you should be talking about risks and benefits. The risk of dying in labor and delivery these days is extraordinarily low, so it wouldn't be this kind of a conversation. But back then, even in a normal delivery, you can't guarantee that everything is going to be okay. In day-to-day -day life, you can't guarantee that everything is going to be okay. I don't like how cocky he is. I would not like working with somebody like that, and I would never let somebody like that take care of me. Being able to say, I don't know, we will do the best we can, or we will find somebody who knows, is such a marker of being a good physician, or nurse, or midwife, or whatever you are. Being able to collaborate with people, work together, it's always better to have two open minds looking at something and working towards a common goal than to have one hard-headed person who thinks they know everything. This is really scary and I'm kind of worried. It's a girl. And they're both. They're fine. They're fine. Maybe the other doctor is just crazy, I don't know. Sweet face. Oh my head! Oh my head! Sybil, let me bathe your forehead. <laughs> Okay, she has a terrible headache. I am very worried she's about to seize. If this were happening in my hospital, I would want IV access. If we had just diagnosed severe preeclampsia that we needed to treat, a four gram magnesium bolus in an IV followed by two grams an hour would be the standard treatment. Oh God! <laughs> What's God, happening? God, no! This is eclampsia. Sybil. Sybil. But it cannot Mary. be. <laughs> Sir Philip, you were so sure. Help her, help her, please! Don't <laughs> oh, leave me. No. Dr. Clarkson, should we take her to the hospital? There's nothing that can be done. But Once the seizures have started, there's nothing to be done. But you don't agree. Oh man, okay. She's seizing and 
she's not breathing. In a hospital, we can manage this because we have things we can give to patients to make them stop seizing. For eclampsia, if somebody came in and they were seizing like this and they didn't have IV access, we would give five grams of magnesium in an intramuscular injection in each, each cheek of the bottom. And then if they continued to seize, you would give some kind of anti-seizure medicine like Ativan to help stop the seizures. In this time period, I don't think they knew to give magnesium to stop or prevent seizures. And once seizures start, sometimes they don't stop if you don't treat them. So in that time period, a lot of times, once you started having seizures, it was too late. You can't do anything now. Once preeclampsia progressed to eclampsia, it was almost a death sentence. If it happened while the baby was still inside, then a lot of times the baby would die also because they couldn't do anything to make it stop. We're very lucky we have treatment for this nowadays and it's extremely rare for a mom or baby to die from preeclampsia or eclampsia. It still happens, it's extremely unusual, um, but it wasn't back then. It has to be something worth trying. No, please, no, please. Come on, come on, breathe, love. Come on. She can't breathe. No. I'm not attached to these characters, but surely she's not going to die. And even if she does, there are two doctors just standing around. I am with the family here. Do something. Even if you can't do something, look like you're trying to do something. Do something! Please. <laughs> this is painful to watch. Please wake up, love. Please don't leave me. Please don't leave me, love. <laughs> She's 24 years old. This cannot be. 24 years old. Heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. We are so lucky to live in a period of time where the chances of dying from something like preeclampsia or eclampsia are extremely rare. And did you see that doctor who really thought this is what's going on walk up? I can't imagine what must be going through his head. He knows this family, presumably cares about this girl and her family, and he knew what was happening. And that other jerk of a doctor completely blew off his assessment and prevented them from potentially saving her. It's horrible. This is depressing, guys. Why did you want this episode? Because if we'd listened to him, Sybil might still be alive. But Sir Philip and your father knew better and now she's dead. Okay, guys, that was super depressing. <laughs> the risk of dying in childbirth, luckily in this day and age, is very low. But this does raise a bigger question about maternal mortality. Maternal mortality in this country is higher than it should be. And we are working so hard to figure out exactly why it happens more than it should now, but it's still extremely unusual. I'm gonna go try to do something happy and we will be back another day for another fun video. Thanks for coming guys.